Away I go. Right, okay, so the first question started off with our basic stuff. We got a binary number, write it down in deanery. You can try and be clever, no calculators though, remember. So easier to just put your column headings on. In fact, don't bother putting the column ends where the notes are, as long as you keep doubling up. So you go, oh, like 8, 16, 32, 6, 4, 1, 2, 8. Makes it a little bit easier for you to add up. Okay, so we've got 20, 128 and 20, 148 plus 3, which is 151 maybe. Okay? All right? So it's the process. I'm more interested in the process than the answer. You've got the mark scheme. You can look at it. Right, it says on the next question, state the representation of the deanery number 125 in hex. Right, you can go straight from the deanery number to hex decimal, but it involves doing multiplications of 16s. Okay, so you can do that, and I'm not going to show you how to do that. If you're interested in that, look it up. But the better way... Because there's a relationship between binary and hexadecimal that you need to like just get completely familiar with. The better way is to write 125 in binary first. So I'm going to do that. So it's like, where do I start? Well, I'm going to put column headings in. And I'm going to try and write 125. Well, I haven't got any... 1 to 8, but I can have a 64, and I can have a 32, which is 96, which leaves me with, what does that leave me with? If I take 96 away from 125. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be 25 plus what, 4? So that's 29. So I can have a 16, and an 8. So that's another 24, that leaves me 5. So I will get that in binary. So that's 125 in binary. Hexadecimal has got a beautiful relationship with binary. It's why we use it. Because the way that it works, 4 bits represent a hexadecimal digit. Because a hexadecimal digit is values 0 to 15 which is exactly what four bits can represent. Okay, so all I have to do in order to write down quickly from binary to hex is to group four bits together. What do we call four bits? A nibble, correct. Yeah? The reason we bother to name what four bits is is because we have this relationship that we use with hex. So we thought we would give a name for that. Right. Whenever you're grouping, always group from the smallest end, the least significant bits. Because you might get a question where they give you seven bits and say, what is that in hex? And you go, oh, make sure I do it from this end. And then group the next four. What would that bit be? If it hasn't got a value? Zero. Okay? Doesn't matter. Right, so always group from this side. And then you just got to read the number as if it was just four bits. So it's 8 and 4 is 12, plus 1 is 13. Now in hexadecimal, once we get to 10, we have to start using the letters, don't we? So 10 is A, 11 is B, C is 12, 13 is D. So that is D. I've done it in lowercase because it's clearer. If I do a D... And I do a very good D, it looks like a D. If I do a sloppy D, it could Whoa. be an O. Whoa. You know what? I have seen some sloppy Ds from students. It's good for you, sir. Yeah. Right. The next one is four bits. It's the number seven. So 125 in hex is 7D. Okay? With all these questions... You do it the way that you find simplest. I will show you methods, but I'm not going to say you've got to do it this way. If you can do it a different way, quicker, then do it that way. Okay? If you've got a certain mathematical 
leaning, you may have other ways of doing it. I don't care about that. <laughs> right, okay, moving on. Last question on this page. ASCII. ASCII, our way of representing characters. So we just say these numbers, they don't represent numbers, they represent individual symbols. Okay, now ASCII, which is our ancient way of representing characters that we've had around for ages, what's the more modern way of representing characters? Begins with U. Yeah, Unicode, correct. Okay. ASCII's limited. This question says, how limited? And it says, it uses seven bits. How many different characters, if we've only got seven bits to represent them, how many different characters? What was that? Correct. It is 128, but how did you get that, Jaji? Right, so, and this is, this is one way of doing it. I'll show you another way. But yeah, if they say, and they'll ask these sort of questions all the time with different numbers of bits. And when we do the uh, pictures and how we store bitmaps, you'll see that you have to be really au okay fait with this. Right, so if we've got seven bits, we can whack all the headings in, which is what Deji said he did. Right. He's put them all in. The biggest value you can represent is all ones. Okay? What's the smallest value you can represent? All zero. All zero. Never forget zero. That is your smallest. So if you add all those up, you will get what is the biggest value. So if we add all those up, we get 127. Plus zero. All right? So if you're asked how many combinations or how many things can you represent with a certain number of bits, it is what is the biggest number plus one, effectively. Okay? Plus one. There is an easier way and a quicker way that involves no arithmetic. What's the next column heading? What's the answer to this question? Ooh, suspicious. Let's see if it works. Right. If I say to you, four bits, what range of values can we represent with four bits? So I'm going to use the same method. I'm going to say, okay, four bits. I'm going to put a one. I'm going to add them all up, 15. Plus one, because of the zip. Remember the zeros. So I say, plus one, oh, answer equals 16. What's the next column heading? 16. Which is the quicker and easier method? Next column heading. If I said to you, with eight bits, how many different values can you represent? Oh, you're all doing it in your head now. Two plus six, isn't it? Because it's the next column, isn't it? What if I said, with 16 bits? Well, you don't know what the column is, do you? That's the thing. So let's do 16 columns. Nice thing about binary, you're just doubling, aren't you? Everybody can double. Well, until the numbers start getting weird. Right, next one's 256. 512. Yeah. 496. Next one. What's the next one? What's the final one? Oops. Right, that is 16 bits, 16 columns. The next column, which if I try and draw it here is going to not be on the camera, is 65536. And guess what? That's how many different values you can represent in 16 bits. So that is your trick way. So if they ever ask, ooh, we have got uh, an image that uses three bits per pixel. And they say, how many colours can you represent in that image? And you'll go, eight. You just go, it's eight, obvious. Eight. I don't have to work anything out. It's obvious. 
It's obvious to those people who aren't stupid. Right. That is a, a little tip. Okay? If we can avoid doing horrible, had, adding up that we're going to mess up, then that is a good thing. Right, next question. <coughs> Networks. Right, so we've got uh, houses, computers in each room and a central router. Every room allows both Ethernet and Wi-Fi. So that is, remember, Ethernet is cables, wired networks. Wi-Fi, as its name suggests, is wireless. Right, identify if the house network is a local area or a wide area network. Right, so it's obviously what? It's a LAN, isn't it? Close proximity. But the justification is, so you've got to explain what's the difference. Basically, that's the justification. That what is the difference? But they have got access to all the devices, okay? But they're connected to their own equipment. Generally, when you've got a LAN, you're managing your own equipment. <coughs> With a WAN, how do we describe a WAN? Well, it's, yeah, that's not a description, that's what it, the acronym stands for. Yes, Craig? It normally multiple Potentially can connect multiple lands, yeah. Mesh. Right, the main thing is you've got to talk about the fact that there is a distance involved. But you mustn't, you must not just say wide apart or far apart. You have to qualify it. It's a bit like the old bigger, slower, faster problem. You can't just say that, you've got to explain what you mean by that. So, if you're ever describing a wide area network, you're always going to say, yeah, they're geographically distant, i.e., and you'll explain and give an example. So, at school, we've got a LAN here, all connected to our server behind here, but we're actually connected to the girls' school. Yeah? and the new school. So they can't be a LAN, but together they form a one. But they're distant. We're in completely different sites. We're not very far away from one school, but the other one's a fair distance away. And we do not connect with our own equipment. We have to use someone else's cables. In this example, I think we use BT <coughs> cables. All right, so we send all our traffic via someone else. So when we have internet problems, it's generally not our stuff that's gone wrong. It's the bit in between that we're using on the net, on the WAN. That's always a problem with WAN. You're relying on a third party. And you're relying on someone not going through your cables with a big digger as they're digging a hole up, which happens far too often. You'd be surprised. OK, so it's really important and this is the big thing for GCSE, and the thing that changes from year nine, is we need you to fully explain things and qualify things. So it's no good saying, yeah, it's local because they're all really close together. No, it's local because we're in control of all the equipment, and we can manage the connections directly. And they are close together, that's part of it, but you need to say about that, that we've got access to the devices. With a wide area network, we're using a connection between two sites that are geographically distant, maybe between towns. Okay, you can do a one across the internet between countries if you really wanted to. Right, okay, the next bit. Right, these tick box things are really, really nice questions, but you've got to be careful. Okay, sometimes when they say tick all the appropriate, don't just be fooled and thinking, yeah. Oh, it's either one or the other, or it's both, or it's, you know, there could be multiple combinations that are available here. It could be that both columns are true, or neither column is true. So always make sure you clearly read it. So they're testing, right, you know what a wireless network, you know what a wired network is. So the first one, wired connection, well, it's obviously going to be the Ethernet then, yeah? Because you, you don't understand what Ethernet is if you haven't ticked it. You certainly don't know what Wi-Fi is if you tick that one. I hope nobody got that one wrong. Okay, if you got that one wrong, you need to have a real hard look at yourself. 
Right. Uh, well, you'll find out, won't you? Right. More likely to be affected by interference. Now, the key bit there is more likely. But everything's affected by interference, but what gets it worse? So a wired cable or wireless signals? It's going to be the wireless, isn't it? You do still on cables get interference, which is why we've got different types of cat cable. Cat 5, the real bendy one, that has got no screen on it. There's no shield. There's no like radio interference <coughs> protection. If you, when you, if you ever bought a PlayStation or an Xbox, you always get a real stonky, fat, chunky cable with that. That's Cat 6 cable. It's got a shield. Helps to reduce interference. But it is not as flexible. You can tie normal cable, Ethernet cable up into knots without breaking the wires. Well, you shouldn't, but you can. So it's easy to root. Cat 6 cable a bit stiffer, a bit chunkier, not as easy to get round awkward corners. Okay? But don't ever say there's no interference, because that's not true. Everything suffers from interference. It's how you can how well you can cope with it. Right. Data can be transmitted at a faster speed. The key bit is there which is faster, wired or wireless. It's going to be the Ethernet, isn't it? Right. I mean, some of these are a bit, yeah, I agree. You're stating the obvious there, mate. The next one, wireless transmission. Hmm, which is that going to be? Neither. Neither. Opposite to the wired. It's going to be the opposite to the wired, yeah. Uh, and then the last one, shorter transmission range before data is lost. Well, that's going to be the wireless again, isn't it? Although, really, I mean, we're at GCSE. If you start going up, sometimes it depends what sort of wired connection you're using and what sort of Wi-Fi you're using. There are Wi-Fi systems that can transmit over massive distances. Intel was messing about with one, Wi-Fi Max, that could go kilometers. Fry everything in between with its radiation or whatever, probably. Um, when they were did experiment with microwaves for um, like radar and things, they did a few experiments where they were messing with the powers and the powers were too high and things that went in front of the radar things didn't like it, sort of thing. Um, but yeah, so in general, Wi-Fi, you, all of you will have different experiences in your homes of Wi-Fi. If you're in a home that uses that's like old and it's like made out of stone and brick and stuff, like built in like pre 1960s, yeah. where they used bricks with bits of glass and metal and all sorts of stuff in them, your Wi-Fi signal would be hopeless. <laughs> yeah, me as well. I can't. I can. I've only got to go through a door, and I can have the router. I can have the router there. I can have a wall, and I can be here, and I get. Napo signal. But if you're in a more modern house, they build them with a lot of partition walls. And why can't I just go straight through that? Like, nothing. You don't notice it. There's a problem. And there you go. Right. <clears throat> right, so they've mentioned the router a few times. The purpose of a router. It's to do what? The clue is in its name. In a home network, the route is transporting the data to the devices that need it. It's a router. It routes information. In a wider network, you're right. It does find the least congested paths. But in a home network, you're generally connecting directly to your router, aren't you? So there isn't another path. You're not going to go through... Uh, your brother's mobile phone to send your messages to the route. Oh, you might be. I don't know what you're up to. But you might. You wouldn't do that necessarily. Okay. You connect direct. So in a home network environment, the router is there to traffic your signals to your broadband provider. So when you're all on the web and you're all like sat there on your laptops and your phones surfing, each individual connects to that router and says, "Oh, get me that stuff." The router passes that on to your broadband provider. They send the stuff back to your home router, and your router goes, oh, that was for him, that was for them. 
etc., etc. So it's a router. It, it does the communication between your network provider and your devices that are connecting to the network. And obviously, if you've got a printer on your network, okay, a lot of people don't have printers at home anymore, but if you do have a printer, you can connect to your printer through your router. So you send a message to your router, and your router goes, oh, that's for the printer. I'll pass it on. Okay? Right. So... We need a router basic, but what other hardware might we have, apart from the cables and the router? And the, that is the key bit of the question. You get these sort of questions all the time where they'll say, other than this stuff, give me something else. And you must make sure that you don't just put the stuff that's excluded. And I've seen that too many times. Read the question. Right, so other hardware, network hardware that we could have. Right, NIC. That's an acronym. We need to explain it. It is. Well done. Network interface card. There is another form of NIC called a W NIC. What do you think the difference is? Wireless network interface card. That's what you've got in your phone. I don't think I've ever come across a phone that's got an Ethernet socket on it. It'd be handy. For testing, but no. Um, what other hardware might you have? Power line adapter. Yeah, you might have power lines. Which is what, if you've got loads of manky brick walls in your house, that's what you end up using a lot of. What else? Switch. Right, you might have a switch. Switches are quite interesting. What they allow you to do is the devices that are connected, as its name suggests, it switches and it can make physical connections for you so that you can talk directly to a device okay you generally get small switches you might have like four port switch in a home network you can get massive ones for servers like we've got 64 port switches and things like that but you don't really need those at home unless you've got a ridiculous network at home but yeah you might use a switch to allow you to connect multiple devices what else might you have a <coughs> hub. <coughs> You've probably all got one of these connected to your router. It's all usually in one package these days. You have a router and a hub. The hub is a broadcaster. Yeah, it broadcasts. Everybody sees the data, which is why you have to encrypt it and lock it down. So when you're communicating with your Wi Fi at home, you're actually communicating to a hub. And then the hub sending a message out, it's going, everybody, see what I've got. And then the one, the device that needs it goes, oh, that's mine. Nobody else look at what I'm doing. Sort of thing. That's what, what else have we got, yeah? Modem. Right, modem. A modem allows you to turn digital information into analog information to broadcast down telephone networks. Okay. Or any communication networks, because they sort of tend to use audio formatting and things for those. But that's what a modem is. Again, generally at home, you end up with like a modem and your router and your hub all mixed together in one device. You, didn't, you don't have to, you can get separate hubs. You know, you can get a wireless hub to attach to your router and put your router in pure modem mode and things like that. So that it doesn't act as anything other than a connection to your network. Sometimes that can give you better performance. Any other network devices that you might have at home? Media server, anybody do that? You can use your PlayStation as a media server, can't you? Set up properly. So any of your like audio media files that are stored on your PlayStation, you can access your network. Some people set up a little PC to do that, like a Linux PC or something like that. So you can put your files centrally. It's a bit like what we've got here. All right, where you connect to your files on our server. Okay, you, you've got to be careful. You could start saying things like print server, but this is in a home network. Nobody in their right mind, although I have got friends that do this, no one would have a print server at home. You might have a printer connected to your network, but you don't need to go the whole hog and have a print server. I have got people, mates that I know, who work in like networking, who 
like got stupid network setups at home. I don't know why, but there you go. Right, okay, moving on. Yeah, you could have boosters, uh, extenders. If you wanted to have like, if you've got a garden and you've got a garage, you might put a Wi-Fi extender in the garage. Right, okay, so another binary one. So convert 132 into an 8-bit number. Same process. I'm not going to go through it because I've just gone through one of those. Then we've got the binary one. And the examples are quite evil. They normally just write all the ones and notes together. So you know what I would do is my first job, I'd write it out again. And I'd write it out. So I'm, I'm going to make sure that I can read it. So I'm going to say 1010. Oh, oh, and I'm doing it into hex, so I'm going to leave a gap. So I'm now going to do the final bit. And I'm going to go 1, 1, 0, oh, 1. And it's easy. Treat it as a 4-bit value. So that's 5. So that writes down easy. 5 is 5 in hex. Then this one, we've got 8 and 2, which is 10, plus 1, which is 11. So that's going to be hex digit B. And I'm going to do it in lower case, because a sloppy B... So we find the sloppy B, can Nope. I will, if, right, moving forward, I get anything that I consider lazily presented, I'm not going to mark it. All right, so I'm going to be horrible to you so that you get into a habit. I had a maths teacher who, if we didn't, on our final answer, with a straight line, we had to use a ruler, if you didn't double underline the final answer, she wouldn't mark anything. Yeah, no, but it gives you discipline. It's about discipline. So do you still do it now? Nah. <laughs> right. Binary shifts. Binary shifts. I was talking about this with um, a couple of acquaintances of mine who were building a computer from scratch. And we were talking about, you know, should we put some multiplication stuff into it? Um, and we were talking about, ah, uh, no, you don't need to, don't bother, we can do all the multiplication with shifts. Because you can. So, when you're doing this, they say, show the effect. Shifting right two places. So that means the whole thing is going that way. What happens to the bits that get moved off? Well, they don't die. They, right, they're gone. They're lost. Right, so with this pattern... Again, I'm going to write it out again so we can see it clear. <coughs> it's an 8-bit value. Right, so I'm going to shift it this way. I'm going to do it twice, but I'm going to do it in two stages. I'm going to do a shift and then I'm going to shift again. Right, what number is this to start with so we can double check? I'm not putting the column ends in on purpose. Yeah. Those two numbers are nice, easy to add together, 48. And then we got a 4. So it's currently 52. Right, we're going to shift it this way. So what happens is the bit on the end falls off. It actually does get captured by the CPU. But it's above our pay grade. It's an A-level pay grade. It goes into the carry. That's where it goes. All right, But what we're left with is the remaining bits, and they all move along. So we end up with 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. What do we put at the end? 0. We fill the gap. Right, what number have we got now? 26. Yeah, we could have guessed that, couldn't we? But it is, yeah, that's now 26. And it's halved. Right, we're going to do the final shift. And again, the bit that comes off goes into a carry. And we get left with... Yeah, 13. Which is D in hex. No. Right, so we have got a system where we can divide. What happens if we go the other way, left? Multiply. Doubles. It's the nature of it. If you shifted numbers in deanery, you'd be divided by 10 and multiplied by 10, wouldn't you? Which is what you do do in maths. You know quickly to 
To multiply by 10, you move it along and put a null to the start. Don't you? If you completely lose the plot, here's my tip with shifts. If you go, you know what, I can't remember. I can't remember. I'm not going to abandon the question because I can't remember. I'm going to write down a super simple number. Four. And I'm going to shift it that way once. So I know that's four. I can add that up. I'm going to shift it that way. And I should be able to read that that's two. If I shift it this way, I should be able to read that it's eight. And then I know what the effect is. So if you ever forget, don't panic, just say, right, write a number down, move it, what number is it? And you'll be able to work out the effect. Okay? You mustn't ever deny yourself a chance at a question. It's all about systems. Right, moving on. I probably need to speed up a little, speed up a little bit. Right. This is a question that you really need to read carefully. If they ever say, show you're working, show you're working, you're going to get a mark. Even if you screw it up. A bit like math questions sometimes, where you show the right method, but you've cocked up a number. Right, so we've got 4 gig. How many megabytes? How many more megabytes is a gigabyte than a megabyte? 1,000. So we're going to get... So I could just go, oh, it's 4,000 megabytes. But I'd be throwing away been wor working out. So I'm going to say it's 4 times 1,000. Get a mark. Always show you're working. Right. This storage stuff, difference between hard drives, which is what the magnetic storage is, and solid state, comes up a lot. Right. Advantages of solid state. What's the number one? Right, lightweight. They are lighter, a lot lighter. Now this was a state question, so we can just say it's lighter than a hard drive. Yeah. What others? There's, there's quite a few. Someone else. Go on. Because they're lighter, so it's all like a consequence and effect. They're lighter, so they're going to be more portable, but they're also smaller, aren't they? So the lightness and the smallness make them portable. What's the other big advantage? Go on. Well, that's another a feature of them, silent. Yeah, it's quite weird turning a laptop on and not hearing the hard drive spinning up. Yeah? Typically, it's quicker. Right. Quicker. Right. You must not say quicker. What is quicker? No, what, what is quicker? What is it? Is it? If I throw it, will it go down a hill quicker than our drive? Couldn't do a test. Right. <laughs> that is the key bit. Reading and writing. Yeah, you must, and this is super critical, you must always say faster read and write speeds, because that's what we mean. Often when you're looking at the specs of solid state drives, you will look. If you want something that you're going to be writing a lot of data to, you'll be more interested in the write speeds being high than the read speeds. Okay, it is something that you think about. But yeah, absolutely orders of magnitude quicker than hard drives. Yes, Craig? Right. The magnetic, you can really ruin a hard drive because it uses magnet polarized material to represent nulls and ones. You can destroy it with a powerful magnet. But actually, I wouldn't put a powerful magnet next to my solid state drive either, to be honest. But yeah, they are they are slightly more durable, but that is a moot question. I have got hard drives that are 30 year old that still work. I bet I might struggle with a micro SD card or a solid state drive to find a solid state drive working in 30 years time. The nature of electronics and the capacities that are on them. So the thing that is different, the massive difference is 
Solid state don't have moving parts. Hard drives, I've still got my hard drive. A hard drive has got a disc that spins at a ridiculous speed. You know, something from 5,000 to 10,000 revolutions a minute, enough to cut wood. There are videos on the internet of people using hard drives to cut things. Um, so there's that spinning, so if you wobble it, prone to shock. That, doing that with a hard drive is not good for it. It's also got an arm that moves with a head that floats on top of the disc surface. And you can get a disc crash if the head hits the surface. It's not such a massive problem on modern drives, but on older drives, I remember when I was at school, you used to, before you turn the power off, you had to park the heads. And what that meant is moving the heads away from the main surface of the disc, so that as the disc slowed down, the air that was making the head float lets it sit on the disc. When it's in the place where we're not storing data, that's okay. But if you just turned it off, the head would go into the surface and you would get a disc head crash. Literally, it would crash into the surface. and make a nice big groove. I did that at school when we just got our uh, hard disk. A 10 megabyte hard disk Whoa. that everybody used <laughs> to store their files. How times have changed. Ten meg you can't buy a 10 megabyte hard disk now. Um, 10 megabyte, and I forgot to issue the command park before I turned the network off. And it was like, and I heard it. I heard it. I heard it. And, uh, and I thought, oh no, I'm going to get in right load of trouble. <laughs> and uh, I was mortified for the rest of the day until I owned up to the teacher. He knew I'd done it because he asked me to do it. And I like, I was, wasn't concentrating. Oh dear. You know when you get those sinking moments where you think, oh my god, I should not have done that. I am going to get, that's it, I, I am done for. And it's like, you know you've got to fess up, but you just, the dread. Yeah, I have that. Right, so, it's the mechanical parts that make them a little bit more prone to damage. They don't like vibration. So any situation where you might have some shaking, uh, solid state drive is always going to be your number one choice. Portable devices, laptops. The number of laptops I have destroyed when I've dropped them downstairs and things. <laughs> and I, which I've done that as well. Stone stairs, just to make sure, with no bag. Just drop the laptop because I was carrying it. You know, like you sometimes carry a laptop open. You know, I, just, I won't close it up, I'll just carry it to where I'm going. And you go, hey! down the stairs. Bang, bang, bang. Screws coming out all over the shop. Yeah. A few times I've done that. You think you'd learn, but you don't. I still carry my laptop around like that as well. Anyway, right, so the solid state hard disk debate is one that will keep coming up. You've got to look at the question context very carefully. Right, the next bit, again, we're still comparing and we're saying, right, okay, why are we still using these things then? What are the reasons for still using them? <coughs> Danny? Why storage capacity? Cost per gigabyte is the main thing. Yeah, you can get massive uh, hard drives compared to solid state drives, but the main thing is the cost per gigabyte, or cost per terabyte, however you want to label it. I can, if I get a terabyte SSD, you're looking at around like 100 quid. They've come down a lot, about 100 quid. But if you can get like a, an eight terabyte hard drive for less than that. So even though they might not be as quick, and they might have a bit of noise associated with them, and they've got these mechanical parts so you don't want to like knock your computer off the desk. That's the one thing I haven't done, I've never knocked the computer off the desk. I've pulled a laptop off the desk. I've nearly pulled the computer off the desk where I caught some cables around my foot. Um, health and safety and all that. Yeah, so it's capacities. You get big capacities, but also they are cheap per gigabyte. But don't just say cheap, say like the cost per gigabyte. Any other reasons we might use them? Yeah? Solid state more expensive. Yeah, we just said that, haven't we? They're cheaper cost per gigabyte. They're, they're, they're the real main two ones. It could be that you've got, you're stretching it a little bit. You might have older hardware that you can't 
attach an SSD to. But that's, again, that's not a thing. Solid states have been around for ages. I had one years ago. But yeah. Right, okay, moving on. Right, we get this little algorithm question. This is a good one. It shows that you can follow things. So we get a flow chart, and then they say to us, using these input values, how do we go through it? Follow it through. Follow it through and get the output. Right, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through the answers for that. They're in the mark scheme. But it is a process of just following the decisions. So when you get to the decisions, you're saying, right, okay, that's a condition, just like when we're coding. And we say, is it true? If it's true, just follow the line. Notice the flow chart. All the lines where we've got decisions are labelled. That's where you go if the answer was false. That's where you go if it was true. When you, if you get asked to draw a flow chart, and they're not necessarily massively asking you to do that, but if they ever ask you to complete a flow chart or something like that, make sure you label your decision outputs. If you let, if you had that like that, you wouldn't know which way to go. You'd be guessing, and we don't do guessing. It's a process. Right, they then asked you to write this in pseudocode. Right, so let's have a look at this. Right, input x, input y. When we do input in pseudocode, how do we write an input like that? If we're going to, this is like getting stored in X, isn't it? So how do we do it? Yes, Craig? Like it's what? Like in no. Right, we're going to have input, aren't we? Yeah, we're going to have input, definitely. But where is that input going? Storing X. So we write it like that, don't we? So get me the input, store, which is what equals means, remember, in x. Same for y. Easy marks for the first bit. And then this, a decision, how do we do decisions in pseudocode? What's a decision statement? If, yeah? Everyone happy with being if? Right, so we say if, and we can literally do this. So we can say if x is greater than y, and then if that is true, what part do we do from the diagram? We then ask another question, another if. So we say, all right, if that's true, the next question is, if x is less than 12. If that's true, notice I'm not trying to do the whole thing in one go, I'm just following it through. Then I say, right, oh, if that's true, output x. So I'm going to say, um, we don't tend to say output, what do we put? Print. print. So we'll say print x. If it's not true, that bit, so I'm looking at this one, it says output y, so I'm just going to do that. So I'm going to say else print y. But that's not finished it off. That was, I followed the true bit through from here. But I've got to follow the false bit as well, haven't I? So when this was false, so we can say, right, well, that was the true bit. That was all true. There's nothing to stop you doing something like that. And you go, right, well, else, I need to multiply them together for, for whatever reason. <laughs> Who knows? You'll never get any sensible algorithms. They'll always do weird. You know? Yeah, right, whatever. So we're just going to output those two things multiplied, which you can do in multiple ways. We could store it first. But I'm just going to do it and go print x, that's because I'm afraid it moved on to the next bit there, x times y. Make sure you always put an asterisk for multiplies. We're not doing maths, we're doing computing. Uh, and that's it, isn't it? That's it. End. That was six marks, that question. Hopefully you had a good uh, attempt at that. Okay? Right, you can see the answers in the mark scheme, remember, so you don't need to worry about that. Right, and then there's one more question. And again, it is about tackling it. Not when you get a question like this, let me zoom that in a little bit. 
I've zoomed it in a lot of it. Right, when you get a question like this, there'll be a lot of info, but the key bit is the bullets. Do the bullets. Look at it. So it says, right, develop an algorithm. You can do it as a flow chart. If you get a choice, use the method you want. <laughs> I'm not going to do the flow chart one. I'm going to do the pseudo code one. No, because I want us to really like get so comfortable with pseudo code. But anyway, ask the user to enter a character. Outputs lower if it's a lowercase character. Outputs not lower if the user has entered any other character. You must use the built-in char to code subroutine. They've given us it and they've explained how it works. That's the crucial bit. I'm going to do this bit first. Because I know I'm going to get some marks for that. Even if I can't work out the rest of it, I'm going to do the input. That's easy, isn't it? So I'm going to say, and it says, ask the user to enter a character. So I'm going to put input, enter a character. But I need to store that input. So I'm going to say, store it in, I'm going to call it C. It didn't tell me what to call it. So I need to make up a name that's suitable for me. Right. We then need to check if it's lowercase or uppercase. And they've given us a clue there. So if it's a lowercase, we're going to output lower. If it's anything else, we're going to say not lower. So we're going to have to do an if, aren't we? So we need to know what the ASCII code is. So I'm going to do this in steps. So I'm going to have a variable called code, and I'm going to say whatever you give me. So I'm going to say char. Right. It's very important that if you get given a name for something, you spell it exactly the same. So you've got loads of these horrible underscores here. I don't know why, but they have. To code. And I'm going to give it my thing that the user typed in. C which I stored in C. So that gives me this code. I then need to examine that code. So I have got 97, 128. Anyone remember what the ASCII code is for capital A? If little a is 97, no, 1, 2, 2, Z. 32 less. What's, na what's 97 minus 32? 65. One of the bits in a binary number, when you've got ASCII, tells you whether it's uppercase or lowercase. The bit with the 32 column. Okay? So you can do this several ways. It's, I don't know why they've written it like this, really. They'd have been better off saying capital A is 65, what would big Z be? It's 32 less again. 122 minus 32, yeah, 90. The only, the only thing you need to remember is capital A is 65 and that the lowercase is 32 bigger. That's all you've got to remember. But they'll tend to give you information in the exam as well. This is from an older paper where they might have needed you to remember all the ASCII values and things. But, but it's just an, it's an exercise. Right, so if we knew those, this would be uh, easy to spot the uppercase characters. Okay? But we don't need that for this question because we were looking at the lowercase. So we've got a check to do on this number to see what? What have we got to check to say, oh, that's definitely a lowercase character then? What have we got to check? If the char character event... Yeah, go on, Craig. You've got to check if it's from 65 Well, that's if it was uppercase. That was just me asking if you knew about the uppercase characters. In this example, they've told us what the codes for A and Z were. 
Come. I did all the checks, so everything was clean. Yeah, it, we, we basically, this problem is what we call a range check problem. We know that all the lowercase characters, because they've told us, start at 97 and go up to and including 122. So if that code we've now got is at least 97 and it's less than 122 or equal to 122, then it must be a lowercase character. So we need to now work out how to do that as an if. So we can say, and we can do it in, I'll do it in multi-parts and then I'll show you a quicker way of doing it. So we can say if code, because that's where I stored the answer, is greater than or equal to 97. So I said, right, okay, let, here we go, we, we, we've got a chance here. If it's greater than that, and then we could actually say, right, well, if that's true, we could say if code is less than or equal to 122, then we're going to print out, what was it, lower. And again, if they've asked you to print something specifically, make sure you have, don't like go and say, oh, it's low case, mate. Top job. I hope everyone's paying attention to what we're doing. Because that would be tragic to have a teacher in front of you and to not pay attention to something when they're explaining quite complicated things to you. Right, so we can do it like that, but there's a better way. When we're doing a range and we say, right, we want a number to be in between two values, we do a compound condition. We just say, right, well, I want that to be true, but also, because actually 2 million and 6 is bigger than 97, but that's not going to be a lowercase letter. So we can say, and I also want the code to be less than or equal to 122. So it's in a range. And that's always how you do a range check. Always. You're saying at least this and less than this. If you're entering a score and it's a percentage, you want it to be between 0 and 100, you do the same thing. You say, if score is greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 100, then it's a valid score. Unless I've done one of my quizzes where you get bonus points and you can get more than 100%. <laughs> right, oh, yeah. but by doing that, you're simplifying the logic. Yeah, I have done that, haven't I? Yeah, <laughs> a few times. Average uh, right, so I'm going to print lower. And then, if it isn't in that range, they said anything else, not lower. So actually, this, for seven marks, was actually quite trivial. But, the key thing was, and the hardest bit of the whole thing, you had to be able to do that bit, but it was using this properly. I have lots of students make lots of mistakes. When they get told to use a function that's been defined, it does a job. I've had a lot of students answer questions where they don't use it and they start trying to write the function, weirdly. Does anybody <coughs> in this room know how print works? How it actually works? How does it take text and display it on the screen? Anyone know how it works? But it doesn't stop you using it, does it? Anyone know how input works? Or do you just accept it does a job, it does a job we want, it gives us whatever's been typed, and we'll then work with what we've got? You don't need to know how internally something works to make use of it. So again, here, we don't know how they're doing this, and there's loads of ways of working that problem out, but we can use it. So be very careful when you get a question where they're saying, use this, it works in this way, it will give you this information, that's what you're interested in, the information it returns. So in this case, it gives us an ASCII number. They've helped us, I mean, these, this is irrelevant, this, we didn't need this information, but it helps us that they've given us the range check. That's what we have to pull out of this question. What are we testing this number against? You could have done that directly and put char to code C there. So let's have a look what that would have looked like if I was being trying to be lazy. 
So I've, I'd have written this. I'll put cod as well, yeah. Oh, it's the fish version. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's for, for when you're underwater programming. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Had it? Ooh, no. I don't like fish. Fish fingers is as close as I get to a fish. Oh. I've never liked fish. I don't know why. I think it's from a Doncaster fish market. Getting dragged round as a kid and I hated the smell. Uh, right. It's horrible. And it was a big market as well. So you had to, like, I got good at holding my breath. <laughs> right. A lot more easy to make mistakes. What do we say about programming? Why do we keep names short? So you can't make mistakes. Reduce. No, no, no. No, no. Nobody stops you making mistakes. You reduce the chance of mistake. The less characters you type, there is a direct correlation. The less you type, the less mistake. If I've got type five things, I can make five mistakes. If I type ten things, I can make ten mistakes. So we keep things short. So that, that isn't good. I could do the ultimate lazy version of this whole program. Let me do it. Let me just blank the screen. So I can do it properly. I don't know how dark that's going to be on the camera. But if I, if I, yeah, I don't know if I can do that on this. I don't know, forget a white really piece. Tough. But I'll do it like that. I'll do it like that. Right. Here's the ultra lazy version of it. So I can do, I'm going to do code again. But this is the sort of thing you can do, and you tend to you tend to see in other people's code quite a lot. So I can do char to. I'm going to put code, not cod. Right, good, good. Come on, stop. Stop. Right. What I'm doing there is I'm saying instead of storing it in a variable. What I'm going to do, I'm going to be lazy, and as soon as I get the return value from input, I'm going to pass that value straight to charter code. It's going to give me the return value, and I'm going to store that in code. Which, yeah, nice, it's compact. It means my code can be shorter. But shorter is not necessarily good. And then do my two outputs. I can't bother to do it. Right, short is not necessarily good, always, because it can start getting messy. And I can make mistakes here. If I'm in a programming environment, an integrated development environment that's helping me with brackets, then yeah, that's great. If I'm in a programming environment, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm in, for whatever reason, I'm to use Notepad to write my code. I might be, you do get situations where you think, I need a text editor. I'm on my phone, how the hell am I going to do this? So I use some NAFO text editor on my phone, and I haven't got programming support. I could easily mess those brackets up. If I want to change something, I'm starting to mangle a big line. Clarity is preferred. We want things to be short so we reduce mistakes, but we want things to be clear. Okay, so when we're programming, I am going to beast you if you write me rub I'm not looking at you specifically, George. Rubbish variable names. Sloppy. Okay. But it's so short they don't mean anything like A1 and things like that, which I know you've used, George. Things like that. Um, right. I am going to be horrible to you over variable names. And I'm going to be horrible on lazy shortcuts. And... Let's try and make it as compact as possible. If, if you want to do that, I will present all my programs in lazy, short form programming. Just see if you like it. In some languages, you can do some really crazy things. Yeah. You, can, you can abuse loops and all sorts of things. I might do that. Right, I will upload that, gents. That will be ready. I'll put a link on the Teams thing for Thursday when the assignment comes out and you get your papers back. Okay, thank you everyone. Oh, what it? Oh, it's not too bad.